Welcome, folks. This is uh, Bianca Frogner, your host for today, and I'm just going to give it another minute or so to let people get online. So thank you for joining for those already on. Good morning or almost good afternoon to uh, folks who are on the East Coast and morning to those on the West Coast. I, I'm Bianca Frogner. I'm a professor over at University of Washington in Seattle, and I'm part of the leadership uh, group for the award network at UCSF. Um, I'm the chair of the webinar committee, so I'll be hosting today. Uh, I'm really excited to see folks join. I know we're kind of here in the middle of summer, so many people are busy with their um, various summer vacation plans. Um, so we are also recording uh, this webinar so that it can be viewed um, afterwards. It'll be going on our website. Um, before I introduce our speaker for today, um, I wanted to just take a moment and encourage people to visit our website, uh, awardnetwork.ucsf.edu, uh, which you probably have seen many times. Um, but specifically, I wanted to highlight our webinar page where we don't only advertise our um, webinars uh, ongoing uh, in the future, we also have uh, our list of prior webinars and you can find links to recordings there. So I certainly want hope that folks go back to take a listen to any webinars that they have missed. But also we would love to get your input because we are still in our early stages of our network. And we really wanna leverage kind of what the network has to offer by hearing from you all about ideas you might have for future webinar series. So there is a link at the top of the web page uh, where you can click to enter a survey. Uh, it's a brief one where we would love to collect your thoughts on speakers or topics that you would like to hear. And our webinar committee, which includes uh, myself, Emily Franzosa, Madeline Sterling, Koi Wen Shu, and Jarman Ye, uh, we will consider these um, ideas to set up our future webinars. Um, also, if any time you, you have an interest in joining the webinar committee, feel free to contact me or anyone uh, on, at the award network, and uh, we will certainly consider including you as a future committee member. So with that, I certainly don't want to take up too much time, um, and I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Susan Mitchell. She'll be speaking about the NIA Impact Collaboratory, which is a really exciting um, network in its own right. And there are many activities, I think, for this network um, to take note of, and they, there are ways to even engage uh, with the Impact Collaboratory. So Dr. Mitchell, she's a geriatrician, a uh, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She's also a senior scientist at Hinda and Arthur Marcus um, Institute for Aging Research at Hebrew Senior Life in Boston. She is uh, an attending geriatrician geriatrician at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, and her areas of in research interest certainly overlap a lot with those of us here in the network with an interest particularly on those with dementia. Uh, she is the PI of uh, several large projects, uh, projects including um, the Impact Collaboratory. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to her. Uh, I'll be monitoring Q&A and, and uh, chiming in if I see anything clarifying that needs to be uh, con considered and answered on the spot. Otherwise, we'll hold for major questions at the end, but feel free to enter them along the way using the Q&A function um, in, the, in your um, Zoom window. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Susan. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Um, good morning on the West Coast, afternoon on the East Coast. Let me just get my slides up. <clears throat> Perfect. All good? Yep. Great. Okay. Um, so let me. So um, this slide everyone probably have seen, but just making the point, I think right now it's over 6 million uh, Americans with uh, Alzheimer's disease or related uh, disorder. Clearly, an urgent public health need on how we're going to provide care for uh, these people as well as their care partners. Um, there has been work that shows that um, non-pharmacological interventions have some efficacy, but adoption into either healthcare systems or broad uh, dissemination has been limited. 
Um, and so I'm going to talk today a lot about pragmatic trials, um, which are uh, a method of clinical trials that are meant to really accelerate the translation of interventions into clinical practice. So I'm going to give a little bit of background about um, how we got here to the IMPACT Collaboratory and then spend the rest of the time talking about opportunities um, and activities within the IMPACT Collaboratory. But just to um, mention um, and to play sort of pragmatic trials, and sometimes I might call them EPCTs, embedded pragmatic clinical trials, um, into sort of uh, uh, con con conceptually within the clinical trial framework. Uh, but traditional clinical trials um, have are largely done in very well-controlled standalone settings, sometimes even... Um, research uh, laboratory settings or clinical research centers. Typically they um, select a very non-diverse population that don't typically look like the, the messy kind of patients we uh, see in the real world. Um, traditionally, a lot of them have been underpowered and so have come up with, uh, have yielded some inconclusive results that are both expensive uh, and um, uh, not very helpful. And again, because they're done in these super controlled settings with super controlled populations, they, they don't have that much applicability to the real world. So they're, the traditional randomized clinical trial um, evokes a, a disconnect between research and clinical care. In contrast, and I'll describe EPCTs a little bit more, but um, Pragmatic trials are really uh, several things set it apart, uh, but one thing is that they're really designed a priori with a lot of stakeholder input. I, I'm going to use the word stakeholder, although I appreciate that that term is um, becoming uh, out of vogue, and I appreciate why, um, but I will mention uh, them as care, uh, research partners which include both um, people living with dementia and care, and care partners, but also healthcare systems, uh, frontline providers, et cetera. So we try to design EPCTs with those people in mind and think about how the interventions being tested can be integrated into routine clinical care flow. Oftentimes these um, type of studies are done with data that's already being collected from real world data sources like uh, electronic healthcare records or administrative databases like Medicare claims, get a bit more into that. I already mentioned that we have a more representative study population than the highly selected traditional randomized controlled trial. And we try to choose outcomes that are important to decision makers. So rather than moving systolic blood pressure, for example, by two points, it's whether there's less admissions to a hospital for hypertensive crisis kind of thing. So let's dive a little bit more into the uh, key attribute uh, differences between an explanatory and pragmatic trial. Um, but an explanatory trial, and this is your traditional uh, clinical trial, is really is about efficacy. Can the intervention work in highly controlled experimental conditions? Whereas a pragmatic trial, the question is, can, can a certain intervention work in, in real world practice? Um, so I mentioned the setting and explanatory trials more ideal, whereas uh, in pragmatic trials, we have the messiness of trying to embed an intervention in the real world. Typically, and this is, but not always, uh, explanatory trials are randomized at the individual level, often because Pragmatic trials are testing sort of programs that in the real world would be rolled out at the unit level of, let's say, a nursing home or a primary care practice. It's often a cluster randomization, not always. Uh, I mentioned the selectivity of participation and how that differs. And in an explanatory trial, there's very strict enforcement with protocols, et cetera, with adherence to monitoring. So often it's research staff that are uh, delivering the intervention as well as monitoring adherence, whereas intervention, often the interventions applied by uh, frontline providers or care partners or uh, people, real people in a real world setting. So there's a lot of uh, challenges with adherence sometimes. Comparator often in a randomized uh, traditional trial will be a 
placebo controlled, whereas in a pragmatic trial, it would be, you know, real world alternatives. So, you know, often just sort of typical usual care. Um, I mentioned that, oops, uh, the um, outcomes are in explanatory are, are usually much more proximal outcomes. My example before was like measuring uh, if you're testing um, a program in hypertension or something like that, an explanatory trial might actually uh, look at the outcome of actually blood pressure measured by a research team, um, whereas an outcome in that example for pragmatic trial may be admissions to the hospital for um, a hypertensive crisis or something or something like that. In an explanatory trial, researchers uh, typically do the data collection, so it's very carefully collected. In a pragmatic trial, it's often using existing data uh, from point of care. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, partnership uh, engagement is usually much uh, more uh, involved from the beginning at all stages in a pragmatic trial, whereas in a traditional trial, it, not so much. And I won't go through this again, but this is um, a framework called PRESI2, um, which is a framework that was made to look at the different typical aspects of a clinical trial. For example, I went through most of these setting, recruitment, uh, adherence, follow-up, outcome. And um, it's meant to give a gestalt of is some is one of these design aspects more explanatory or more pragmatic, with the pragmatic being at a higher number or more outside the circle uh, than inside the circle. So the point here is each of these domains would typically make up a design of a trial. Some can be more pragmatic and some less pragmatic. And if you imagine dots pull put on these spokes for the different designs, you end up with sort of what they call a spider diagram. And a very open circle would be your most pragmatic circle uh, trial, whereas things more contained around the center would be more of a traditional randomized trial. So with that, um, about, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago, uh, uh, the NIH became more interested, uh, given the shortcomings of traditional trials, to put some resources and funding into seeing if we can um, if they can uh, improve the national infrastructure to do pragmatic trials and establish something called the NIH, NIH Collaboratory or Healthcare Systems Collaboratory, which was established in 2012 uh, and run by the Common Fund at NIH and is based uh, headquarters of the uh, coordinating centers at Duke. Uh, and they offer to support large demonstration uh, projects, fully powered EPCTs um, across the country in any number of medical disciplines. It could be, uh, you know, psychiatry, geriatrics, cardiology, whatever it is, but to uh, fund some demonstration projects of large pragmatic trials embedded in healthcare systems and sort of try to get the field going um, and really focused on a lot of issues that would come up as the the field massaged out this new approach, for example, with lots of regulatory issues, uh, et cetera, that are come up with these kinds of different uh, pragmatic trials in your typical trial. Um, I was fortunate with uh, my co-PI on the Impact Collaboratory, but way back at this time to get one of the demonstration projects funded through the Impact Collaboratory. Uh, focused on advanced care planning in uh, nursing homes. Uh, but over the next few years, sort of NIA um, uh, realized, National Institute of Aging, that um, when doing EPCTs focused on dementia specifically, there really were some really sp even more specialized focus, for example, compared to studies done in hospitals about cardiology or other, other areas. Uh, dementia populations have specific healthcare systems like nursing homes, assisted living, very specific data sources, uh, for example, Medicare claims or the minimum data set that's done in nursing homes. Even more specific ethics and regulatory challenges because of the vulnerable population, the issue of consent, um, and complications with respect to outcomes because 
dementia is a dyadic illness. And so when we talk about outcomes, we're talking about patients and care partners, as well as healthcare systems, et cetera. And how do you get some of these outcomes from traditional real world data sets, like for care partners, you know, uh, they, who aren't often linked to their patients within the patient's medical record. Certainly a lot of design and stats issues specific to this, as I mentioned, the dyadic nature, but also more loss to follow up due to the age of these patients, et cetera. And um, unlike some other fields, typically the dementia interventions, non-pharmacological behavior interventions are also very clinically uh, complex interventions and challenge in settings uh, with adherence problems. So with that knowledge, the NIA decided we needed our own collaboratory um, that's truly focused on uh, dementia and um, established or put out a call for proposals for a healthcare systems research collaboratory focused on AD slash ADRD, which um, we applied for and got funding for in um, 2019. And that was, uh, we called it the NIH Impact Collaboratory. Um, which was focused on building the nation's infrastructure to do pragmatic trials specifically in the dementia population. This is just sort of the sort of the organization of it. It's 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 a very large uh, undertaking. This was a fifty-four million dollar project. So you can see that the way it's organized, we have EAP steering committee, uh, an administrative core that's shared between Brown University and my institution, the Hebrew Senior Life in Boston. And then we have a number of working groups and cores that uh, support um, the intellectual design and conduct of EPCTs, everything from ethics to outcomes to tech and data, design statistics. We also have a training core, uh, a pilot studies core, et cetera, you can see. And in these cores, there's a leader as well as about six or more uh, national experts in uh, these given areas. <clears throat> and uh, these are, you know, those members of all the cores, plus the admin core sit in a, a large uh, um, number of areas around and universities and institutions across the country. So the mission of the Impact Collaboratory is to build the nation's capacity to conduct pragmatic trials of interventions within healthcare systems for people living with dementia and their partners. We have a, a, a big, uh, audacious uh, vision, of course, to transform the delivery of care for people living with dementia and their care partners and our values. So uh, it's 2003, so we're, you know, four years-ish into this, uh, interrupted by uh, COVID. But um, in the next set of slides, I'll, I'll tell you uh, how we developed and where we are. Um, we basically achieve our mission in four ways. One is we support the design and conduct in ECPTs by funding uh, a number of study uh, types of uh, grant mechanisms, which I'll tell you about. We also are a resource for other NIH funded investigators doing pragmatic trials in dementia funded outside the impact collaboratory. We are committed to building uh, investigator capacity, again, through awards, workshops, uh, and other programs, which I'll describe. Then we, um, because this is a fairly nascent field, especially uh, conducting EPCTs and dementia, a main um, uh, aim and objective uh, to achieve our mission is to develop and disseminate knowledge uh, about the conduct of these studies. So this is, uh, you know, scholarly work done to promote the advancement of these method, the methodology. And then we also catalyze uh, partnership collaboration as well. Um, integrated in all these things is a commitment to um, health equity. Um, and I'll talk more about that um, as we go along. So flash forward now, four plus uh, years and um, under each of these headings, uh, you're not meant to uh, get into all this or understand the details, but this is just our uh, so-called accomplishment slides in each of these. So I'll just give you an example. To this point, we've funded you know, 11 national competitions for grants, uh, project grants around EPCTs. Um, uh, we provide a lot of consultation. We have now in knowledge dissemination, we have a lot of 
uh, items now in something we call our knowledge, knowledge repository, including a bunch of peer review articles, reports, et cetera. Lots of support for investigator capacity with seven cycles of uh, grants for investigator training, et cetera. I'll, I'm going to take a deeper dive into some of these, but this is sort of my whole talk in one slide type thing. So let's just start with the design and uh, conduct of EPCTs. Uh, we have two grant mechanisms. Uh, one is our pilot study grant program. We have two requests for applications annually. These grants are 200 uh, K in direct cost per year. And the goal is really to uh, conduct, a, one might even consider these more a feasibility study to prepare for a full scale, fully powered EPCT. So really to massage out all those aspects, can you implement uh, the intervention uh, in the paradigm of an EPCT? Can you ascertain outcomes using uh, typically real world data in a pragmatic way? And can you identify your subjects in a pragmatic way? Again, often using electronic healthcare records. If you can do those three things, you're probably ready to do a full scale EPCT. We do also fund those full-scale EPCTs under a um, grant program called the Demonstration Projects. Uh, this is annually. We fund, they're actually a little bit more now than 500K in direct costs for 18 to 24 months. And I mentioned the, the goal is to do a fully powered EPCT. Um, just to mention, so these projects, the Demonstration Project EPCTs, You've probably seen this is the NIH stage model that takes intervention development from stage one, all the which is just an idea generation, all the way to stage uh, five, which is implementation and demonstration, with lots of arrows in between because there could be a lot of iterations and circling back and forth. But just to say that the, the impact collaboratory is firmly seated in stage four effectiveness trials. In other words, in the ideal world, a uh, given intervention that's ready for an EPCT has already shown some degree of mechanistic efficacy in a, in a more tightly controlled study um, uh, to give some signal that it works under, you know, in quotes, perfect experimental conditions before we embed it into the messy world of an EPCT. There's a lot of discussion about this because, uh, you know, the intervention you test in a, an efficacy trial by definition gets manipulated and is looks different in a stage four effectiveness trial. Um, but just again, in an ideal world, there would be some signal of efficacy before you move on to an EPCT. We learned from the very beginning that um, this not only was the field kind of naive, but the investigators were extremely naive when we put our first call for proposals out for pilot studies in 2019. What we got back was kind of a mess um, because the investigators really didn't understand what an EPCT is. Um, and we weren't so sure either what, an EP, what a pilot study for an EPCT was. So over the first year, we realized what we needed to do besides refining what we expected was to really, if we really wanted to build the field, including investigator capacity, we really had to leverage the experts on impact to guide uh, these applicants. And we developed quite a unique system uh, for providing consult direct uh, applicant consultation during the application process. So what happens in the pilot studies if someone submits an LOI, if they get accepted for full application, those applicants and their research team then get matched up with a consultant team from IMPACT, and they meet with them up to three times before the application goes in to go over every single aspect of their application, how we can, and it's not meant to be like a study section, it's meant to help them understand how to construct their pilot study so it will be in line with an EPCT and have the most rigorous methods possible. During the course, they can also have one-off consultations. So let's say somebody really needs more help with their statistics design, they can meet one-off with our statistics core and massage out that piece. 
And by the end, we ask to see their specific aims before they submit. Now, the consultation team is completely divorced from the review application and acceptance team. So there's no conflict of interest there. Uh, but this has been one of the most rewarding parts of the Impact Collaboratory, I think, for everyone involved. Um, so to date, we've had uh, eight cycles of pilot grants, three cycles of pilot projects, and you can see how many we funded. And we've had a lot of uh, consultations um, along the way. And I, you know, I meant to see these. These are some of our pilot grant awardees. Uh, uh, the latest up to date, we've just accepted or we'll be funding uh, at least three more, uh, some of our demonstration projects. And um, yeah, okay. So the next um, sort of column in that uh, accomplishment slide and um, our objectives is to build investigator capacity. So we have two types of awards there. One is a career development award, uh, we give one or two out annually, usually two, sometimes three, um, depending on the year. Uh, and it's 110K in direct costs for two years. And the goal is really uh, to mentor an early stage investigator uh, who's interested in intervention development in dementia, but with an eye towards um, doing eventually pragmatic trials. Um, and these are typically pre K type awardees. Um, in fact, almost all our CDA awardees have moved on to traditional K awards at NIA. We also have a healthcare system scholars program. This is meant for a little bit more senior person, mid career, who's done a bunch of sort of traditional trials, but really now wants to get into the pragmatic trial world, but really doesn't have a very good understanding of what a healthcare system how an healthcare system operates. So if you're trying to partner with, I don't know, Kaiser Permanente and want to embed some program for, I'll make this up, I don't know, improving um, uh, or deprescribing or something like that, and you're gonna ask the people in the clinical care flow to implement this, you've got to understand what the priorities are at the healthcare system, how to you know maximize adherence, et cetera, et cetera. So we, provide funding for a scholar to embed themselves in the healthcare system for a year to really understand how to uh, engage them uh, in a partnership to have a successful EPCT. <clears throat> Just to show you, here are some of our uh, Career Development awardees. And in purple here is sort of what they've moved on to. And you can see many of them have K awards or other, uh, other awards, several People have gone on to some of our other project awards as well, or like Jen Gabbard uh, moved on from a uh, early CDA awardee and actually is now a member of uh, uh, one of our our pilot core. So you know that sort of speaks to we're also interested in moving along the next generation of leaders in this area. Here are some of our healthcare system scholars. And um, we actually, I know you guys are uh, focused on the workforce and here are a couple of our career development awardees uh, are uh, focused on that. One about communication for nurses, another, I think Cheney gave a talk to your group about direct care workers and Kathy, uh, Catherine Abbott is um, also uh, focused on uh, training care, uh, care providers in some way. Oops, sorry. Other training opportunities including our annual training workshop, which is typically held the last week in uh, January. This is open to anyone at no cost. Um, we were planning to do it in person, but COVID forced us, forced us to do it uh, virtually. And we've actually continued to do it virtually afterwards because we realized um, we reached the greatest amount of people. This is sort of a day and a half training opportunity for early to mid-career investigators to develop competence in, um, in EPCTs. And again, uh, we usually have a call for um, um, participants in uh, later in the year, just November-ish, uh, and anyone could attend this training workshop. The other cool program we have is a faculty scholars program. There's no salary support, but this is for um, sort of K-level uh, career investigators 
And they're invited through this program to join uh, one of the cores that you saw for a year to really become embedded into their activity. So someone might, for example, be very interested in regulatory and ethics issues. They can become part, uh, an actual member of our ethics and reg core for a year, get involved in the scholarly projects, et cetera, and develop skills. Um, and this has been an extremely successful program to become a faculty scholars, one of the faculty or people on uh, impact need to nominate you, but that's usually no big deal. And we also have a learning library of videos that I'll show you in a second, but this is our example of our training workshops. We usually have, um, I think we keep going up. We had a hundred this year, but we typically focus on slightly different areas um, each year. Um, here are some of our faculty scholars. Uh, from 21, 22. Um, and many, many of these people have stayed on through impact, become core members, gotten grants uh, beyond their uh, stint as a faculty scholar. Uh, oops, sorry, 2023. Um, I mentioned we have these uh, video training resources. These are sort of 10 to 15 minute bite-sized videos. Anyone could uh, access at no charge through our, um, our website. Uh, it's actually on a learning library system called Moodle, uh, and and you can go through and and um, I, I don't know I think there's about twenty of these right now that you can go on and and watch. Um, and this is just the Moodle website showing uh, how you access them. Um, then uh, we have the bucket of developing and disseminating knowledge, um, and we do this uh, in several ways. One, on our website, we have, this is out of date, these numbers, but a knowledge repository. And basically, any product that's produced through Impact gets hosted on a knowledge repository. I'll show it to you, and you can search. So let's say you're interested in health equity. You can put the search term in health equity, anything that the impact collaboratory has done around health equity will pop up in these categories. Um, we also hold meetings and workshops. Um, we have an annual scientific meeting each year, uh, our training workshops and other specialty themed workshops. And of course we go to national meetings and, and hold symposia, symposia there as well. We've created some very specific searchable databases. The mo most robust one is a, an outcomes library. So, you know, Let's say you're planning a pragmatic trial, again, uh, maybe about an intervention to improve behavior in people living with dementia in nursing homes. You're not sure what a pragmatic outcome can look at. You can put behavior outcomes into our uh, outcomes library and you'll get a bunch of options and the options will tell you how pragmatic it is anywhere from sitting in front of a person and trying to record their behavior, which is not very pragmatic, to ascertaining a behavior score from a MDS or something like that, more pragmatic. We have monthly grand rounds um, with associated podcasts, something like these webinars we're having right now, which anyone is invited to. Uh, I invite everyone to go on our website, uh, which hosts all the materials I mentioned, plus a lot of other uh, impact related uh, stuff, as well as all our grant information, et cetera. Uh, this is our, our grand rounds, again, open to anybody. Um, this is just some example of our grand rounds. Uh, this is the knowledge repository that I mentioned. You can put a search term here and um, you'll come up or you can search on just papers or grand rounds and you can come up with um, all the stuff we've been doing. And this is an example of our iLibraries. We use a platform called Airtable, which is super cool. I'll just show you how it works. So let's say, example from the outcomes library, you want information about the diet, you want to get an outcome about dying. Uh, it'll take you to maybe something, an option in the uh, CAPS hospice survey, and it'll give you more information about that, how reliable it is, how pragmatic it is, et cetera. Uh, we, as I mentioned, were very interested in uh, applying uh, the um, concept of health, not the concept, but uh, making sure that uh, we embedded in our pragmatic trials from start to finish the uh, issue of health equity. Uh, and we felt if we didn't um, conduct health equity focused EPCT, we really weren't, um, you know, achieving our mission because dementia 
uh, affects a larger number of minoritized populations, and they also typically have worse outcomes and worse quality of care. And so we, in the spirit of a pragmatic trial, we want to be examining uh, interventions on people that have the disease. Um, and we feel very strongly that health equity should be integrated into all aspects of scientific concept uh, conduct of pragmatic trials, not just that NIH enrollment table that you have to submit because how many uh, black or Hispanics or whatever, but really there is every single aspect of a trial, never mind an EPCT, has considerations of health equity, and I'll show you a little bit more about that. But there really was, you know, there's almost limited data about uh, integrating health equity into a, a traditional trial, even less into pragmatic trials. So we, uh, we're starting from a fairly blank slate. We do have a health equity team or core. Um, and one of the main products that we've developed is uh, best practices for integrating health equity in EPCT's best practice sheets. Um, I think of all the products Impact has developed, this is one of the most important. But basically, it, what it takes you through is a different design. It's meant for the point of where you're kind of thinking about your design for an EPCT and how from the very get-go you should think about integrating health equity um, into every aspect from community uh, partnership engagement, design analysis, selecting your healthcare system and participants, how you design your intervention and how you implement it and how you select outcomes all with health equity in mind. Um, it's almost like a mental checklist to go through as you do this. They were meant to be fairly simple, these these sheets, we're calling them. Right now, we're, uh, we're supplementing this and just finishing creating short videos, two or three per sheet, that really go into some of these uh, best practices. There are six per sheet. Um, and we're creating a certificate online program with these videos. But these have gotten a lot of attention, uh, particularly even outside the area of EPCTs, because to our knowledge, this is one of the only existing tools about how to systematically integrate health equity into design of a clinical trial. Uh, another guidance document we have is how to create a value proposition. You want to go to a healthcare system and, and sell your idea of your intervention and try to convince them to let you test it in their healthcare system. And this is guide you on how to, how to, how to do that, how to partner with the C-suite, et cetera, to get uh, your idea um, over, the, over the precipice of trying to get them to do it. And the last bucket I'll just briefly mention is uh, impact uh, committed to uh, stakeholder or we'll say partnership engagement. We have a, a healthcare systems core that has developed a learning health network with different settings, healthcare settings that treat um, people living with dementia from long-term care, hospitals, emergencies, and have really partnered with the healthcare systems leaders to in these areas to identify their priorities for managing patients living with dementia and try to really elicit their priorities and then try to match that somehow with investigator-driven uh, interventions that would meet the priorities of um, these healthcare systems. It, it is very, very, very challenging to do that. To, in other words, to partner what an individual investigator thinks is, you know, their baby, their intervention, but then actually matching it with the priority of a larger healthcare system so that both the investigator and the healthcare system are equally engaged in, in, in doing the project. We also have partnered with the Alzheimer's Association to create a lived experience panel. This is a panel of uh, actual people living with dementia uh, and uh, health part and care partners to be their voice on it to help drive the mission of impact. Um, what uh, we convene them multiple times a year to discuss selected topics that will help the impact leadership uh, create priorities, whether it's for a call for pilots or where work more uh, more work needs to be done. Um, we have uh, several uh, uh, episodes of what we call the lived experience panel, where one of our cores, for example, the outcomes core, will have three 
meetings with our lived experience panel to discuss what are their, what do they see as the most relevant outcomes to them um, and uh, come up with, let's say, uh, when we held this, one of the outcomes that caregivers and partners felt and persons living in dementia we felt were particularly important was to reduce um, hospital admissions. And so that became a focus for some of our calls for pilots. We've had other lived experience panels focus on ethical challenges of consent, non-consent, and uh, currently our health equity team is uh, working with our lived experience panel to develop priorities around uh, health equity. We've also embedded the um, a subset of lived experience panel in a um, partner grant review uh, where they actually are uh, reviewing uh, some of the applications for pilot studies and uh, you know basically ask them, is this project important to you? Does it address an unmet need for you? And will it really make a difference in the real world for people living with dementia? And we do take their uh, reviews quite seriously in our selection of funded projects. Um, I'm gonna skip this for the sake of time. Um, so I encourage you to engage with IMPACT. We're currently uh, in our fifth year as of July 1, and we'll be uh, applying for renewal, um, but all our activities are continuing on uh, for at least a, a good year or so, so um, and probably and hopefully for another five or 10 years, five, 10 years after that, but um, uh, encourage you to, uh, in, you know, engage with us, attend our grand rounds. You can attend our uh, training um, seminars and um, yeah, I think that's it. Great, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Susan. It was so rich and so exciting to hear all of what the Impact Collaboratory has kind of pulled together. Uh, I do see one question that came in uh, that was a little bit of a clarifying question, but I'm thinking that maybe the last slide was helpful in terms of uh, someone wanted to know uh, when is the training meeting taking place and where they, they can find the link to apply. Yeah, so if you just um, go to the Impact Collaboratory website, so usually the applications, or I call it an application, but it's I don't think we ever denied anyone from attending. Um, it's somewhere around November-ish. Um, and um, our, I hope the award network is part of our distribution list for announcements. We'll make sure that we yeah. are connected if we're not. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the name of our communications person to make sure. Um, and it, it'll be front and center on our Impact Collaboratory website, but um, you can keep checking under the training core and it'll be there. But uh, um, I actually have the dates, but I think it's the third week. Let me just check this year um, in January, but let me double, double check because I have it. Right. In the meantime, please, those in the audience, if you have other questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A function. Um, this and year, I, it's the 24th and 25th of January. Fantastic. And we'll make sure that we get that information to also share via the award network. So, yeah. Um, well, that's great. And I just had a couple questions maybe to help kick off the Q&A section here. Um, so it was really interesting to hear the evolution of uh, kind of the pragmatic trials and educating folks about it. And I'm curious, is there like a, a common misconception about what pragmatic trials that tends to persist or a misunderstanding that people have about what pragmatic trials are about? Uh, it's not really a misunderstanding, but they're, they're very hard to do. And I think people don't kind of appreciate that in some ways. I think the biggest challenge and that the unexpected challenge and should be expected by now but really the sort of achilles heel is is the um implementation piece um each part is challenging but the actual when you get on the ground to try to implement an intervention in a healthcare system it's very hard and so the more complex the intervention the more multimodal the intervention the harder it is um, so if you have like a, a training program that involves, or a program for, I'll just say deep prescribing that involves, you know, nurses attending, you know, a training session and then going online and doing something else and then filling out a form and then 
in a busy world, you won't get you won't get it. And you'll end up with something called implementation error, which mm-hmm. you'll end up with a negative study and you won't know if it's because the intervention just doesn't work or the interven- it, or it didn't work because it wasn't implemented. But if everybody did it, it would work. Um, that's, I'd say, 90% of the um, conclusions of pragmatic trials, including one I did myself. It's just tough. And so the simpler the intervention, the better. And there is a, um, a construct called nudge interventions, uh, which which probably work the best. They're super, super, super simple. They're almost uh, imperceptible. It could be something on a medication order. So a physician, for example, goes in and orders, um, I don't know, an antipsychotic. And instead of the need to uh, re-prescribe or re-certify the uh, subscription prescription every 30 days, on the back end, it's made every six days. And that actually changed the physician behavior. Mm-hmm. So that change from 30, is it called a nudge intervention? And uh, actually Penn, University of Pennsylvania has a whole nudge trial uh, unit. Oh, wow. Uh, and they've done some very interesting studies. Um, so it could be drop downs. It could be any anything like uh, Scott Halpern just finished one where instead of hospice being a um, an active thing that's, uh, that a doctor had to um, order what happens is through his mechanics he identifies people in the back end using the ehr who are high risk of dying through some sort of algorithm and then the physician gets a pop-up and say this person's getting a hospice uh consult unless you say no so he changes the default those are sort of it's all based on uh, behavioral economics so those are very simple interventions that are tested in a pragmatic fashion that have have less of an Achilles heel with respect to implementation. So, yeah. I'm, I'm curious because we do have a number of people in our network who are not clinicians and they not, may not even be housed in a clinical department or have uh, many connections to the clinical world. And it sounds like the Impact Collaboratory does provide some uh, quite a bit of hands-on support to get people to set up their first pilot. Um, but are there things that you can recommend to early stage uh, career folks who are looking to want to make better connections to clinics or better understand the world of what's happening in the clinical workflow? Like where would they start to try to understand that? Well, I mean, I think it takes a village, you know, and so um, someone who's removed, like we do get applicants who are more in the informatics world Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of these things happen with EHRs and they're very interested in applying their algorithms to an EHR, their PhD data scientists, but they don't have the clinical part, you know? Um, and so they need both, they need to partner with a clinical researcher and a clinician um, and a healthcare systems person, you know? So I think it's, don't be naive, but I think in pragmatic trials, especially uh, it really takes a robust team, you know, from an uh, in, uh, implementation science expert, a data science expert, a clinical expert, uh, a statistician who understands the um, cluster designs and all the power, cal- you know, so it's, it's um, it, it, it takes a world and, you know, not, you know, you can't be naive about it. I would also say the other piece of advice is, um, it's a little tricky, but try not to jump through the stages of the NIH stage model mm-hmm. uh, and to take the stages relatively seriously. Um, so you can't jump from an idea to a pragmatic trial. I would say with the exception of a very, very, very simple nudge. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Well, that's great advice. And certainly working in teams is more fun anyway, but I I know I have learned a lot from my clinical colleagues uh, in terms of understanding the reality of what's happening in the clinic that I can only learn about theoretically sometimes in a book. (laughs) Um, So I think another question I'll just uh, kind of throw out there is that 
I think it's really interesting how one of the goals of the pragmatic trial is to use data that are already in existence. And you mentioned EHRs as being one source of information. And maybe it's kind of two questions I kind of have as related to that. One is that I know that EHR records are oftentimes not really prime and ready for researchers to use. And so I'm kind of curious about some your thoughts on kind of the readiness of clinics to be able to share the data, even if they have it. And the other one is, what if there's only like one or two data points that might be missing that people want to figure out how to collect? Is is that something that people grapple with? Yeah. Um, so I will say, so, I mean, you do have to be pretty confident that your EHR is collecting, especially when you're talking about patient identification, outcome ascertainment, pretty st in a pretty standardized way. That's reasonably valid um but it's always 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 a compromise in a pragmatic trial so you might be interested in um i know you guys do workforce stuff to see um i don't know does does a does a program to help uh, cnas clinical nurse assistants manage dementia patients you might be interested in, I don't know, if there's less depression among the CA, CNAs or less stress, but there's no EHR in the world that is collecting CNA stress levels. And so um, that is not an outcome you can get in a pragmatic, that is not a pragmatic trial outcome. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll have to compromise with something and some things are sometimes you get so distal it's meaningless like you know i don't know you could look up whether the cnas had get to the you know have hospital admissions for depressant or something or maybe you have a link to some pharmacy that looks at antidepressants but it's it's hard mm -hmm. um and it's sometimes not very satisfying mm -hmm. um so but more and more using technology um there's more ways to embed some of these more what we consider primary data collection into EHR. So Epic, for example, the healthcare system has been, you know, ha let's say you want a field to be put into Epic, like, you know, nurses or caregiver depression or something like that. In many, in some cases, they'll allow something to get put up on a patient portal or something like that, where, or even, um, it could be a, uh, an iPhone app or something like that where you can uh, ascertain these things, you know, in a pragmatic way, but, you know, it takes some working with your IT people. The other technique that's more and more being used is natural language processing. So, um, you know, in the example I gave, maybe it's, um, uh, I don't know, looking at... Um, interactions between CNAs and uh, and patients that are aggressive or something, but leveraging the the um, progress notes to do it using natural language processing. So that's sort of an emerging area. That's great. Well, I, you know, I don't want to take up the Q&A, but I'm just anticipating the kinds of things that I know some folks might be yeah. thinking about, um, even because I know folks will be joining in the recorded version later on. Um, I, you provide a lot of great resources and highlighted some uh, folks who have gone through the net, uh, through the impact collaboratory and you're right, Cheney um, Fabius mm -hmm. did present to us, which was really um, a very informative uh, 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 webinar. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you see as maybe some um, exciting things that have come out from the NI, uh, from the NIH impact collaboratory so far and, and really thinking with the mind of what, value add have you seen the pragmatic trial studies kind of show in the literature um that we weren't really seeing before it's a great it's like the 54 million yeah. dollar question <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> <laughs> uh it, and it's not the easiest one to answer yeah. to be honest with you because a lot of us studies are still ongoing uh, several of the pilot studies are now going on to full-scale EPCTs. Um, you know, we think that there's promise in uh, collaborative care models, um, interventions. I can't, uh, you know, so we had one uh, demonstration project around that, but if you take together what's already been done, plus some of the work we're seeing, uh, we think there's um, 
there's probably some, you know, juice in that to really make collaborative care models part of uh, healthcare systems. And um, some also deprescribing programs, I think are, you know, getting to the point where of science of evaluation that could be implemented. Um, but, uh, you know, these, I've said to you, these trials are tough. Yeah. Uh, it's tough to show a, a, an experimental, it's tough to do the experiment and tough to show outcomes. Um, I think that we need more time to build the field to really come to the answer of whether this paradigm of a pragmatic trial can be done and can be worth the investment. I don't think we have an answer to that yet. I'm sure. Yes, I realize that we're still in the early stages. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and again, you're providing so many resources. And it's clear when listening to your presentation, all the work that has to go, has been done just to educate researchers who are interested by also educating right. the various stakeholders. Yeah, I mean, we feel like we're still building the field, but we're nowhere near our vision of like, uh, you know, improving dementia care for the world. It's we're not even close. Sure. Now, are there certain groups that you would love to see more involved in pragmatic trials that aren't currently? Uh, well, you know, it's a constant um, challenge. We really would like to see um, more work and we're always trying to reach out to um, sort of less well-resourced universities, um, historical black universities, others uh, to really try to get uh, integrated studies into uh, focusing on more health equity. Um, it's a two-sided coin because to, you can see to do a pragmatic trial, you actually need a lot of research infrastructure. Uh -huh. And many of these places uh, don't have that and don't have the partnerships, but we don't want all these studies to be done at Kaiser and all these studies, you know, even though they have the resources to do it. Um, so that that's that's we we're always looking for um, to bring up the investigators and the field uh, from a health equity standpoint, both in content as well as investigators. That's uh, that certainly leaves food for thought for folks in the audience. And um, again, we really appreciate the time that you're taking with us uh, to sure. talk about the NIH collaboratory, um, Impact Collaboratory. It really uh, has been quite informative even for myself. I'm thinking in my head about ways <laughs> to maybe get engaged more with it myself. Okay, we welcome, welcome you. Yeah. The best part are the people. I mean, for me, that's been it, you know, to see someone progress. I showed Natalie Douglas. She's a speech and language pathologist uh, from sort of a uh, non-well-known university, but she's sort of come into our fold and and she wouldn't have had a chance otherwise. Like it's those person, you know, that I really, um, I, 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 you know, it's the most enriching and valuable. So please join us. Well, thank yeah. you so much for taking the time and sharing these resources and okay. again, we'll post this up online and Thank you again okay. for okay. taking the time. Take care. Have a great Bye. day. Bye-bye. Yeah, Thanks, everybody.